And welcome in Lake Kick on the air. It is Thursday night, January 6th, the Overlord 2022. The dog sled, the Huskies are just outside the studio. Producer Jesse, director Colin, and myself. Look, we're not quite live tonight, but we had to get this thing in. Massive snowstorm moving through the downtown national area. Even as we speak, it's going to be a tough trip home, but we had to get it in because it is not a spring game. It's not preseason. We don't do that in college football. It's the national championship game. And as we have told you for about a month, this is the night, the Thursday before the Monday in Indianapolis when we're going to predict the national championship. So we will have a full game preview tonight, mere moments from now. We will predict the winner. We will give you our pick against the spread. We'll show you what the model thinks. I'm going to tell you what each team needs to do to win. I'm going to tell you what those semifinal games meant. And I'm also going to tell you what, if anything, we'll see repeated from the SEC championship game, which seems like five years ago. It's really just like a month ago. Uh, thank you so much for watching. We're high atop snowy downtown Nashville, Tennessee. Also tonight, a lot of you have been asking this already. I tell you be patient. You tell me shut up. You want to talk about 2022. Well, we're not going to quite do that, but I am going to take a look at seven or eight teams in like quick hitting fashion. And it's, they're teams that to varying degrees people think are going to be contenders. Maybe next year, maybe in the next couple of years. Uh, it's a lot of big name programs. So I'm not going to talk about SMU tonight. My apologies. There will be time for that. But I'm going to tell you what I think. Because some of these I don't think have a prayer. And some of the other ones I think may be right on the precipice. They may be ready, whether we say it or not tonight, to be ready to go in 2022. Look, it's going to be a very, very interesting weekend. Because, uh, well, whenever we can get out of here, we're going to head to Indianapolis. Uh, we got the national championship game Monday. We are going to do late kick live from Indianapolis somewhere. Sunday night. So be on the lookout for that. But as you know, as you've come to expect on my social accounts, I basically the show starts here. But really, there's some stuff that I show you, especially on game day, on the Instagram live and, and the Instagram story and Twitter that you can't get here. I can't just go live every 15 minutes. Make sure you're following at late kick Josh. So many of you do the few holdouts, the few of you who waited all the way until the national championship game. Why not hop on board now? Okay. I don't want to waste any more time. We have got a jam-packed show tonight, so let's dive into this. Uh, oh, boy. I, look, before Colin, and don't even start it yet, but before I even get into the game preview, you got to understand how big this is for someone like me. I have a little bias here. I grew up right on the Chattahoochee River. It's not just an Alan Jackson song. It's a real river down there. It separates Alabama and Georgia. You got Phoenix City on the Alabama side. You got Columbus on the Georgia side. I grew up about 15 minutes north of Columbus in Fortson, Georgia. Uh, not Fort Sun, but Fortson, not Fort Benning, Fort Sun, Fortson. And um, Georgia and Alabama and Auburn, like, those are the three concentrated fan bases there. When we were growing up, a world where two of those teams could meet in the national championship game was pure fiction. Uh, obviously, Alabama and Auburn could never even meet in the SEC championship game. Obviously, Georgia and Alabama could, but they didn't. Bama and Florida did like 38 times. Alabama, Georgia... They really didn't. And at Harris County High School, that was the split. There was a bunch of Bama kids. There was a bunch of Georgia kids. Uh, Georgia had the upper hand when I would have been in high school. At, Nick Saban comes along right around that period. But um, I, I just remember thinking, like, how insane would it be? The world would just spontaneously combust if these two ever met in the SEC championship game, much less for a national championship. And how blessed am I? You fast forward a few years. Not only have they now, as of Monday night, met twice in five seasons for a national championship and a couple more times in Atlanta for an SEC championship, I actually get to cover it all. That is a dream scenario. So just to understand, if I seem a little more fired up than the mundane kind of oh, Eeyore style, here we go again, another SEC title game, it's because it means a little bit more to me. Someone should start an ad campaign that reads like that. It just means more. I think it would work. All right, let's dive into this. Here we go. Georgia, Alabama for the national championship. Where else would a team from Athens face a team from Tuscaloosa but Indianapolis, Indiana on a Monday night in January? I'm not going to complain about the venue. I'm not going to complain about anything. It's time to dive in and get to work here. Hey, I got a question for you. When you talk about stopping Alabama, when you talk about Georgia beating Alabama, who is Alabama? What's the identity of the team? See, a lot of times... For instance, the last game Georgia played against Michigan, you could pretty well decide Michigan was a run-first team. They work a lot of play action. There's some trickeration here and there. That's Michigan. 12 times out of 12, that's Michigan. Alabama, you have no earthly idea who they are week to week. I want you to think about the stats I'm about to give you. Against Georgia in the SEC championship game, 
One of the reasons why a lot of you, including myself maybe, were so surprised at the outcome was because you got so much out of Alabama you had not gotten all year long. Not just to mention the up-tempo approach, not just to mention the functionality of the offense, not just to mention so many guys coming through at the right time, including that offensive line. Think about the fact that in terms of run-pass ratio, the SEC championship, Alabama, ran it 26 times, they threw it 47 times. You flip the script when you go to the semifinal game. So they ran it 26 times, passed it 47 times against Georgia. They ran it 47 times and passed it 28 times against Cincinnati. That is a total inversion over a one-game scenario of Alabama's offensive identity. Nobody else out there does that. No one's capable of doing it. It took a long time for this Alabama team to get to this point. They're so young. Kind of side note, been trying to tell you, this is the team you got to clip. If you're going to get them, get them. A&M did. Will Georgia get them? I just, I'm fascinated by this. Because as you dive into like what it takes to win, both teams have seen the path at this point. When we were going into Atlanta, we could not say that about Bama. Like Bama had not seen Georgia lose. Uh, Bama was an underdog against Georgia. But now we're in the national championship game. Think about this as we dive into the preview. Both teams have seen the path. Bama has seen the path because they blazed it. They beat Georgia. So there is no more guesswork. Can it happen? Yeah, we did it already about a month ago. So Alabama beat Georgia already. But even though Georgia hasn't beaten Alabama, everything that Georgia needs to have happen, they've seen happen like two or three times. First off, A&M flat out beat Alabama. Florida nearly did it. But if Georgia does anything remotely along the lines of what LSU was able to do to Alabama or what Auburn was able to do to Alabama, Georgia will win the national championship. What a mouthful, by the way. Georgia will win the national championship. I know a lot of you who are not emotionally tied into this thing, if you're not like a Georgia fan, you're just watching and saying, oh, someone will win Monday night. Hey, if Bama wins, they just kind of chunk it on top of the pile of national championships they already have. If Georgia wins Monday night, you may be so caught up in the fact that, oh, they finally beat Alabama, you may not even immediately realize, hold up, they also won a title. They haven't done that since, flips through the book, 1980. This would be historic if Georgia wins. What do they need to do? What does Georgia have to have happen in this football game? Well, it's quite simple in theory. It's a lot more difficult to execute. Pretty simple in theory. You don't have to go back far. What would it be at the time of kickoff, about nine days prior, they did everything they need to do. It was just against Michigan that they did it. They controlled the line of scrimmage, which we cannot say they did against Alabama. They consistently pressured the quarterback, which we cannot say they did against Alabama. They ran the ball for better than five yards per carry, which we cannot say they did against Alabama. And therefore, thankfully this is one of the last times I'll say this, they afforded Stetson Bennett the luxury of passing rather than put him into necessary passing situations. Now, those are four very simple boxes to fathom. They are infinitely more difficult to check, especially a critical mass. I mean, you can't just do one or two. You need all of them. I would not worry about shutting Alabama down. There's a lot of talk out there about what Georgia's defense needs to do to shut Alabama down. Well, nothing. Don't worry about it. What are, you, are you only planning on hanging three points or seven points? If the answer is yes, don't even bother showing up. Georgia can score. Georgia probably should expect to put out a better offensive production number than they did against Alabama last game. But look, if you're going to get into the mid-20s, upper 20s, if you're going to be able to score even to that degree, you don't have to shut Alabama down. What you have to make sure you do is, number one, don't let their best beat you. Certainly. I mean, there's going to be a lot spoken about Jamison Williams and the impact he's going to have on this game. Bryce Young, especially his scramble ability. But look, if you can just focus on havoc, pressure, in other words, and if you can just focus on forcing high leverage situations. Bryce Young's going to make you pay in some of those, but it's a whole lot more advantageous. If you're making him beat you on third and nine with someone other than number one, Jamison Williams, than it is just sitting there third and four picking you apart. Because it's a two down situation virtually every time when they're third and manageable anyway. That's what Georgia needs. Uh, there's some other more intricacies that we can get into in just a second, but on the surface, that's really what Georgia needs. Can they do it? remains to be seen. What does Alabama need here? You might say, well, they just need a replay of the SEC championship. That's not the way football works. They score in threes and sevens in this game. So theoretically, one bounce of the ball could equal a swing in 14 points. You know, I was watching the replay of the SEC championship, by the way, because I'm always fascinated at 
how, how a change in the trajectory of a game, just one degree, when you, you know, span it over four quarters, can make a, a three-touchdown gulf on the scoreboard. You know, in this game, it was 10 to nothing Georgia, and Bama was facing a third and two. That was the long touchdown to Williams. But I'm sitting there thinking the opposite. I'm thinking, what if they had a false start and it backed up, and then they just uh, there's an incomplete pass, or you know, it's a throw to the sideline short of the sticks, fourth down, or fourth down, Bama punts. That that stuff could just as easily happen. It didn't happen in the SEC championship game. What I'm saying is when you claim that, oh, all you got to do is do what you did in Atlanta the first time, it, that's not the way it works, okay? So this is an entirely separate game. They reset the scoreboard. You got more injuries on the Bama side. You're probably healthier on the Georgia side. Uh, and among those injuries, potentially along the offensive line for Alabama, John Mechie certainly out in this game. More on that in just a second. So what does Bama need? They need, well, theoretically what they had the first time. They need tempo. They need volume. They do not need to settle in to this game. They need to attack. It needs to be a pinball game. They've got to get volume plays. That's what they need. Uh, they need Georgia defensively on the field. They need to get as many looks early on. They need to let Bryce Young throw the ball as many times as possible. You've got the better quarterback. You've got the best skill guy. you got to let him work. you got to let him work. But speaking of that skill guy, uh, to me, this is one of the critical factors of this game. It's not that hard to figure out. Number one in Crimson, Jamison Williams, all the attention will be on him. In fact, if I were Georgia, I would almost be arrogant in my approach. I would look at him and say, you will not beat us with him. That is not going to happen again. And look, if you think you got someone else over there that was in high school this time last year that's going to beat us, we'll tip our cap to you. If you're able to pull that off, we'll tip our cap to you. We don't think you can run it on us successfully. And quite frankly, we really don't care if you try because once we get you in the red zone, you are not going to break the goal line running the ball on us. And we're not going to let you do it with number one. I don't care what we have to dedicate to it. You are not going to beat us with Jamison Williams, which begs the question, your passing attack, let's play a little fill in the blank game. Your passing attack, if you're Alabama, consists of Jamison Williams and, and then there's the blank. Now I'll tell you where I think most people would go. Most people would go, oh, I don't know, Slade Bolden, nice possession type receiver. That's okay, Slade Bolden's not beating anyone. Uh, well, let's, Ja'Cory Brooks, he's come on strong, right? He has, yeah, yeah, Ja'Cory Brooks is a good option. And then you got some other names like Christian Leary, Jojo Earl. Uh, th these are names that have promising futures. You know what I think is going to happen in this game? I think we're going to have a little repeat of that 2015 National Championship game. That one was out in Glendale, Arizona. There was a guy who had all-world potential, had a bunch of stars next to his name coming out of high school. He had played the whole year. It's just he had not been leveraged in the pass game. For whatever reason, he had not been leveraged in the passing game. You'll see Jamison Williams Monday night, but I'll tell you the other name that, if my mind is right here, could end up popping on the stat sheet, and that's Jaleel Billingsley the tight end, number 19 for Alabama, I think that's the guy. Because you see, I have zero doubt in my mind there'll be a ton of attention paid to Jamison Williams. I have zero doubt in my mind Georgia will force the issue with the blitz. And therefore, I have very little doubt in my mind there will be some fairly glaring mismatches out there. Georgia's banking on the fact that you can't take advantage of them because you won't have time. But they know there is a price they pay when they bring extra pressure and they dedicate extra resources to Jamison Williams there will be a mismatch, and I think it's going to be on Jaleel Billingsley. And if I'm George, if I'm Dan Lanning, if I'm Kirby Smart, even if I listen to myself say that, I'd say, all right, I'm going to make him show me. Jaleel Billingsley has not been a focal point of that passing game all year. We know what he said. We, we know what was said about him in preview magazines, but the film doesn't tell us that. But you know what? The film didn't tell you that about O.J. Howard until your eyeballs told you that right there on the field. Uh, he did it twice, actually, in national championship games. One play changes this thing. Either way, when you got games played in the, in the 20s, uh, which is where the Vegas total tends to believe this will be played, one play either way. Jaleel Billingsley, you know, last game it was Jamison Williams streaking wide open. Who knows? Maybe it's that O.J. Howard style tight end down the seam in this kind of game. I would watch Jaleel Billingsley. The prop bets out there when they're released, I'll be on an over yardage total receiving for Jaleel Billingsley. There's this other aspect of the game that's going to be talked about a whole lot. It's the mental aspect. It's the psychological aspect. You know, if you watch this show, we don't talk a lot about it because I really think it's severely overblown most of the time. There is a psychological edge in sports. 
it just rarely works the way that people who sit at a desk behind a microphone think it does. And I'll include myself in that. That's why I don't waste time talking about it. There is an exception to the rule. More oftentimes it's in the NFL than college because I believe that more oftentimes the mental edge matters in a rematch situation than it does the first time the game's played. And you rarely get rematches in college. Well, we got one here. You get them all the time in the NFL. Every division opponent you play at least twice. But here, we've got something we rarely get. Now, here's where I think it comes into play. The first game, Georgia goes up 10 to nothing, as we said, as you saw, and then Bama comes back. So it really didn't bother Alabama all that much. But I do wonder this. I do wonder what happens if the shoe's on the other foot a little bit here. I do wonder, after fully believing in yourself, if you're Georgia, that you've rectified the problems, we're going to have a different approach, different foot forward here, you've got that voice in the back of your mind, you've got those voices out there that have told you there's just something about Bama you can't beat. Now, you've done well enough to block it out, it's been a month now, and you got your mojo back, you beat Michigan, but I've been behind these sidelines before when a lot of that evaporates because of what's happened in the first quarter of a game. Bama didn't have a problem with a 10-0 deficit. I really wonder how Georgia would handle a 10-0 deficit here. Because number one, all that doubt tries to creep back in. You've got to be extremely mentally tough to block it out. Number two, what have we gotten ourselves into there? If Bama's got an early lead, we've got ourselves at least into the area where we are tempted to try and play catch-up. And to play catch-up, you have to throw the ball. Thus, out of necessity, instead of luxury, Stetson Bennett is putting the ball in the air. That does not work out well for them. It has never worked out well for them against Alabama. We've seen it multiple times. Stetson Bennett, they can win a title with him. They will not win this game if they're having to disproportionately rely on his arm. So there's a lot more nuance to the question, can Georgia win one with Stetson Bennett, than just a yes or no. It's yes and no, and then there's a lot of conditions behind it. But I do think that mental edge matters way more in this particular game than it does 99 times out of 100. A couple of wild card factors that I'm keeping an eye on here. The first one is the Georgia yards per carry number. Last game, I want to say it was 3.6 yards per carry. Uh, at least 4.0. At least, I would prefer it be 4.5 or higher, but at least 4.0 is probably a line in the sand I draw. If you are not clicking along at over 4 yards per carry, I'm not saying it's impossible to win. You are putting yourself behind the proverbial eight ball if you're going to try and win that thing. Now, you may dominate special teams. You may have a couple of defensive scores that we could never see coming. But if this game's just played straight up and, and special teams is a relative wash and neither defensive unit puts points on the board and you're not doing it better than 3.8, 3.9 yards per clip, Georgia is probably going to lose. Uh, the other thing I would look at, and it kind of correlates with that, how many third and five plus situations does Georgia face offensively? Partly because that means we're going to find out on third down how often they have to rely on Stetson Bennett throwing the ball. Uh, secondly, I wonder how much more aggressive they may be on fourth down in this game. You know, they made a decision that a lot of people disagreed with down in uh, the red zone, I think it was. At, at the very least, it was plus territory in the last game, and it didn't work out for them. I'd be interested in that because I don't think they've wavered a whole lot in their thinking, just analytically in their thinking in those scenarios. How about Alabama? I'll give you another factor in this game that I think could be huge. Their defenders, their secondary guys, specifically at corner, have not played the ball in the air well. They just haven't. And they didn't against Georgia. They won in spite of it, almost. In fact, there were a couple of times where I saw, it feels like they had 500 flags thrown on them for PI, but there were a couple of times where you almost watch it and you say, well, you know what? Yeah, I gave up 15 yards, probably better than the alternative. Like you're almost resigning yourself to, well, they weren't going to play the ball in the air. They weren't going to defend it properly. Hey, at least they didn't give up a touchdown. And it ended up paying off for them. Look, if I'm Georgia, there are ways to attack Alabama through the air. There are ways for Stetson Bennett to try and attack Alabama that are very high reward and I would say marginal risk at best. And that is putting some air under the ball and just throwing it up to George Pickens and throwing it up to Darnell Washington. They scored a touchdown doing that with Washington down near the goal line last game. I'd do it half a dozen times. I, Jermaine Burton can do this as well. I would just see what's there. That is backyard, sandlot, pickup football. That's eight on eight play calling. I would do it. Because, listen, if they make it that basic, there's no reason for you to make it any more complex than that. So with all that said, 
Let's dive into what the model thinks. So last time we leaned a little bit Georgia, uh, we adjusted, of course. Not only have we taken the SEC championship game into account, but we've also baked the semifinals into account. Uh, we have upgraded Alabama as a team fairly significantly. There is the possibility that Alabama is Clemsoning right now. That used to be a bad thing. Now it's a good thing. There is the possibility that they are in ascension mode very late in the year, and they're just peaking at the right time. If that's the case, our model is still underselling Alabama. Having said that, I think we've adjusted for where they are right now fairly effectively. We've got the game at a pick'em. The number in Vegas is anywhere from two and a half to three right now. Caesars, as of today, has it at Georgia minus two and a half. We've got it at a pick'em. Went back and forth on this a few times this week. You remember immediately after the SEC championship game, I sat right here and I held up that sign. I'm sorry, Nick Saban. I won't doubt you again. Merry Christmas, I think it said. I'm having to weigh that against me thinking that, yeah, it's hard to win a rematch. I think that may be a little overblown, but no, it's not the easiest thing in the world. I think there were some mental edges Alabama had in the first game that maybe not as sharp this game. They may still be there. Uh, you got Will Anderson on your sideline. You got Bryce Young on your sideline, and you got Nick Saban on your sideline. And you know what? I could find several edges for Georgia, but when it came down to it, I could not shake that. I could not shake that we're going to have a neutral site game featuring teams I've already seen this year. And I watched the Crimson team win by, what, three possessions. But that Crimson team still has the best quarterback, still has the best head coach, and still has the best overall player on its sideline. That sounds like a basketball strategy. It's a little more complex than that in football. But look, if I think a game's going to be close, those things matter. Those things really matter. And so I'm going to roll with Alabama to cover, and I'm going to roll with Alabama to win. That is another national championship for Nick Saban. That would be what? He's in his ninth game overall. This would be his seventh at Alabama, his eighth title overall. Insanity. So if Alabama wins, then it's just more history. If that is not to happen, and if Georgia does win this game, you're talking about the Braves winning a World Series and Georgia winning a national championship within a few months span. I don't know that I could go back home. They may just shut the state down for a little while. I don't know how long it would be before uh, you know, the thoroughfares opened up and I could get back in my home state. That would be a very, very extended party, prolonged in nature. And you will have, think about all the things that will have been knocked down, like five Berlin walls fall down. The Kirby not being able to beat Saban Berlin Wall, the Georgia not being able to win a title, just the Georgia over Alabama thing in general. And then there's already a significant portion of the Georgia sports curse Berlin Wall that's broken down. Uh, the Falcons, they kind of strengthened it a few years ago. The Braves knocked part of it down. Georgia could just dynamite the whole thing now. Either way, we're going to see history. But I will wrap it with this. Sounds kind of ominous. It's not. I genuinely feel this way. This is a must-win game for Georgia. I believe it with every fiber in my being. Alabama is as vulnerable this year as you have seen them. Alabama is as young versus one of the most experienced Georgia teams you will see. They had the best path they will have had this year, being Georgia, all year long. This is an ideal situation. Alabama's offensive line is hobbled. Georgia's strength is their defensive front. They are healthier in the ground game. It's all there. It's all there. If you cannot get this done, in this spot. I'm not going to say you never can. Uh, that's clickbait stuff. I'm going to tell you, you will have missed the most golden opportunity in the Kirby Smart tenure if they can't get it done. So I guess all that's left for them to do is get it done. But that's the preview. We will look forward to seeing all you guys in Indianapolis this Monday night. Uh, I'm looking outside right now. Uh, it looks disgusting. It looks disrespectful outside. It is a shame that we are doing the show as early as we are. We're recording the show right now. I don't even think Academy Sports and Outdoors was open this morning when we went out, so I can't get any cool looking new toboggan, can't get a sled. I assume they sell sleds here. I'll put in a special order if they don't. But look, some of you out there live in cold weather climates, so you're used to this stuff. Your city doesn't shut down when a little bit of wintry precipitation falls, but you gotta have the cold weather gear too. And I would encourage you, buy it. Ah, stimulate that economy but do it at Academy Sports and Outdoors and Academy.com. I think Academy.com will be the move for me today because there could be a lot of impulse buying going on when I'm just kind of killing time at the apartment. We're not going to be able to go anywhere. Eventually, I'll get out. 
and I want to be able to get out and not freeze to death. And to do that, Academy Sports and Outdoors has everything I need, has everything the show needs. In fact, that's why you can watch the show free of charge. I was talking to, uh, let's just say someone in the business the other day, and they were bemoaning the fact that they have to work behind a paywall. A paywall means you cannot access their content until you pay for it. And I said, I wasn't going to make fun of them. I, I'm very, we're very blessed that we don't have to do that here because of partners, a partner, singular, not even plural, like Academy Sports and Outdoors. That's kind of where the rubber meets the road here. Our, our audience does an insanely good job of patronizing our partner. But if you're new to the show, the reason I stress this so much is to let you know, I know how mad you get. Like, think about how mad you get when you click on an article or a video, and then it says, $5.99 to finish. You don't see that around here, do you? It's because of Academy Sports and Outdoors. So they help us, they help you. You need stuff anyway. So go to Academy Sports and Outdoors for it. And if you don't have one in your neighborhood, academy.com, boom, that's your hookup. It's our hookup, it's your hookup, it's everyone's hookup. How about contenders? Not this year, we know there are only two contenders left for the national championship, but contenders in the future, 2022 and beyond. What do we think about these contenders? Well. I was asking the other day, it was very brief, then I think the tweet got deleted so you can't even see the evidence, but we were talking about contenders and which teams you believe in in the future. And we got eight of them. I'm gonna go through the list really quick and I just want you to think in your mind, like what are the odds, scale of one to 10, that these teams play for a national championship? Let's not even say win one, let's just say play for one over the next three years. Scale of one to 10, what do you think? Texas A&M is the obvious first choice. A&M is strengthening their grip on the number one class in the country right now, I think the odds are fairly good. I think the odds are eight, seven or eight. Over the next three years, they play for a national championship. Now, we all know who they have to go through to do it, but maybe they don't. Maybe the SEC West gets so strong that them and Alabama are able to make the playoff in any given year. I think a and is going to get there. Remember, we had Jimbo on on National Signing Day. He did not hold back. He did not mince words. Said Connor Wigman, the quarterback, they scouted him as the best in the country. They did not go after Quinn Ewers in large part because of that. They've got a ton of great perimeter skill. Uh, line of scrimmage, I was going to say O-line, but line of scrimmage either way, will not be an issue for them for the foreseeable future. They'll have the quality top line starters. They'll have the quality depth, but they're just going to have more team speed. They're going to be able to do more. I asked them on the signing day show, is there stuff that you've wanted to do offensively that you haven't been able to do because of limited personnel? He said, yeah, pr pretty much, yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a seven and a half. Let's go a seven and a half for Texas A&M. Chances on a scale of one to 10 that they make a title game within the next three years. USC was the next school that I got asked about. I'm only at like a four here. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna go a three. Let's go lower, a three. It's not that I don't think Lincoln Riley will have success in LA, I certainly do. Let's just pump the brakes a second and remember, Lincoln Riley had insane success at Oklahoma. They didn't play for a title at Oklahoma, so he's gonna have to do more over the next three years at USC than he did at Oklahoma. And, you know, let's just call it like it is, he's in a conference that does him no favors. So there's a lot to overcome here. Also, their roster, you may think to yourself, is just loaded and the talent's there and someone's just gotta put the keys in the ignition and crank it up. That's not the case at USC. USC's roster is not what you think it would be. It will be, they'll get the talent there, but it's not an overnight thing. So certainly I don't expect that from them next year. Uh, the year after that would still be pushing it. I'll tell you what I do love is I do love the quarterback situation. I love Jackson Dart being there and look, if it's not Jackson Dart, that means someone like Caleb Williams has decided to go out there, and so it's even better. So the quarterback situation notwithstanding, still think the rest of that roster needs some work. I'm going to go a three on a scale of one to ten. Florida is one of the biggest wild cards on this entire sheet. It could be that they just hit a grand slam and no one knows it with Billy Napier. As I said on the last show we did the other night, the talk of the SEC behind the scenes has been Billy Napier and the staff he's putting together. There are a lot of doubters who would just tell you openly, I don't doubt him anymore, because they didn't doubt his on-field acumen, they didn't doubt his, his game day abilities, uh, they don't doubt him recruiting, and he is a very, very underrated evaluator too. Like a lot of people talk about this in the scouting world, it's just not you know plastered all over every network's game day show. 
Billy Napier checks a lot of those boxes. What people didn't know is, is he going to be able to attract a staff? Answer, yes, he attracted a staff. He is in the process of attracting a staff. And I'll tell you what else. That's just, that's just to kick things off. Year over year now, and this always happens, when a new coach gets in town, you don't ever hire a staff and then they just all stay together the first five years. That's rarely the way it works. So what Billy Napier's done, he's already got a good staff in place, but this time next year, my guess is he'll have even more interest from guys around the country. They're also building a really good uh, army of off-field support staffers, some of whom, in fact, most of whom you don't know the names of, but now they got to put the roster together. Now they got to implement the culture, and I think there is some reverse that has to be done before they put it back in drive down there. That's okay. That's fine. They're making a move for a reason. I'm going to say a f- I'm going to say a four on a scale of one to ten that they're playing for a title within the next three years. Uh, three and a half or a four. I believe in Billy Napier. Please don't mistake me. They play in a very tough conference, so it makes it a little more difficult. There's a different kind of path for them to get to a title game. Miami is a three for me. But Miami is also a big wild card. These two Florida teams, huge wild cards. Because here's what could happen. What could happen is Mario Cristobal could just go completely off the rails in a good way in recruiting. And they could have a flood of talent come in there. The likes of which you never could have expected, even though you know how good a recruiter he is. And so in two years, they could have overturned the entire roster. They could be, they could be a team that is looked at from a roster standpoint as an even matchup with anybody in their conference. In fact, I'll go a step further. I think they will be that. Like, I think when Miami is playing uh, Clemson or North Carolina or, or anyone else in 2024, 23, 24, I think they'll roster-wise be viewed as comparable uh, uh, or equal, maybe even better. Then it comes down to execution. Those are the unknowns. Like, those are the things that we did not see Mario Cristobal Oregon teams do. We never saw them achieve at that kind of level, a playoff level. But we also don't know if Mario Cristobal has maximized his ability as a coach. We don't know that we have seen his version of a program fully implemented. We don't know that. We think we knew it because Oregon was really good. We don't know that for sure. I'm going to go with a three with Miami. But that, that number could change very quickly because you tend to think uh, it's going to be like a one or a two. Three is high. 30% chance over the next three years is because what they could do in the world of talent acquisition. LSU, I'm going to put at a five, five or a six. I would be in the five to six range. You know I believe in Brian Kelly. You know I believe that a lot of the foolishness off the field, a lot of the the LOL type headlines, they will be a distant memory, quite frankly, by the time spring practice rolls around. But they will be a distant memory. He is a proven coach. There's no guesswork here. He'll get the staff put together. He'll learn the right language down there, figuratively and literally. They will get things right. They will have a rock-solid roster. They'll have a rock-solid culture. He will be a culture fit. They're going to be a force to be reckoned with. I'm just, I'm thinking to myself, how are we going to shake things out in the SEC West? Because I can't be believing in Alabama, A&M, and LSU. There just aren't enough wins to go around. We're not talking about winning nine games and going to the Citrus Bowl. We're talking about winning a title. And so with that in mind, it's kind of the same deal with Florida, just on the other side of the division. There, there's so much that has to happen in the sort of whack-a-mole path that you have just to get out of the SEC West that it keeps the number lower. If this were an ACC team, I'd have it at like a seven or an eight that they're going to play for a title within three years. That's how much I believe in Brian Kelly. Uh, what about Tennessee? Tennessee is a two for me, but Tennessee bears watching because there's this quiet confidence around Knoxville that they nailed their head coaching hire. Uh, there is also a firm belief amongst the high school coaches around the Southeast that they nailed their coaching hire. I think if that's true, you're going to see them really leverage the portal hard because this is going to be a destination for wayward offensive talent. By wayward, I don't mean a random two-star out there and no one else wants. I mean guys who have some juice to them that committed elsewhere on an initial signing day, but they're looking around and they're saying, that Josh Heupel offense looks like it fits me a whole lot more than wherever I am right now. This is a dream offense for a quarterback or a wide receiver to be playing in. Defensively, obviously we just watched the Music City Bowl where they had about two quarters, two and a half quarters worth of gas in the tank. There is a ways to go. They didn't inherit any kind of perfect roster situation by any stretch. They made a lot out of a little this year. It's always a good sign. 
in year one. So there's no doubt, there's no doubt remaining in Knoxville. Everyone's convinced they, they nailed the hire, they got the right guy. I'm going to go with a two. No one's going to look forward to playing them, at the very least. North Carolina is one that I think if you took a read of the room, you would have wild fluctuation. I think someone would say, zero, they're, they're, there's no shot they're going to play for a title. I think someone else would say, I'm going to give it like a four or a five. I just think maybe the media preview magazine culture was one year ahead of schedule with them. I'm going to be down at a two or a three, two, two and a half, three, somewhere around there. I do believe that this is a prime candidate to flash a year after you expected them to. Because no one will expect that from North Carolina this year. But see, what they've done is even though you may lose a quarterback, you have the cumulative effect of now having stacked another great recruiting class on top of what you already have there. You never know how that plays out. First off, you never know what could happen out of the transfer portal at the quarterback spot. Just bookmark that. But also, the overall cumulative level of play on that team keeps getting better and better. Now, you don't notice it because we don't talk about tight end or right guard a lot, but it is happening. And so in a state of flux elsewhere in that conference, you never know. All of a sudden, you turn on that TV, and, and you do, it's kind of like Notre Dame this year. Like No one was talking about Notre Dame. They just kept winning games. And they got put out of it late, but they kept winning games. North Carolina could be that with a little more flash. I'm still going to go two or three on a scale of one to ten. Uh, this is not a program that's all of a sudden – out of the spotlight just because they may be disappointed you because you predicted them to do a lot this year. Last team is Penn State. This is not just because producer Jesse threw them in here. I do want to talk about Penn State. Penn State is kind of like North Carolina in a sense that they did not overachieve. In fact, most people would say they underachieved. I'm not so sure they underachieved. Well, okay, they underachieved last year. But think about what the disaster scenario was. The disaster was we find out in 2021 that 2020 was the real James Franklin. Well, at the very least, those fears were eased. But you see, if you're watching on YouTube, how they ended the season. Nothing to write home about. They've got the quarterback in the house now. Drew Aller is in the house. Now, he's going to be a true freshman. I don't know how long it is till he plays. Sean Clifford's coming back. Also drawing AARP mail, but Sean Clifford's back. I also think this is a program that bears watching because it's a program that one year after some people expected things, and they're out of the spotlight a little bit, that could be when they finally take the step. Uh, that's really quarterback-based for me because that's the position I've always focused on with Penn State. So Penn State, I'm going to go with a two with them right now. Uh, they also, they've got a couple of powerhouses up there to deal with. But those are eight programs. Now, there are some I didn't list. I didn't talk about Oklahoma. I didn't talk about Texas. This was not an exhaustive list. So if you've got other programs, put it in the comment section, but also give me your number. Give me the program and then scale of 1 to 10, what are the odds that they play for a title within the next three years? Good show here. Good show. The voice, surprisingly, lasted a lot more than that uh, Mike did. Uh, and that's an upset because I didn't think the voice would make it. Thank you so much for being with us this week. So we're going to be off to Indianapolis whenever we can get the dog sled out of the garage. And we will do our show live from, uh, what is the nickname for Indianapolis? i got to text Will Fong and ask him. So we'll do it from up there Sunday night. Looking forward to seeing all you guys. I know a lot of our audience is going to be up there. Some of you have tickets. Some of you are hoping for tickets. If I come across any, I'll let you know. I do know I have some Academy gift cards. Don't know if that'll be enough to get you in, but hit me up anyway. So until then, for Director Colin, for Producer Jesse, I'm Josh Pate. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your evening, and God bless.